We'll start the meeting with the Karakia from Councillor Timbleton. Takataka te hau ki te uru, takataka te hau ki te tonga, ki a mā kina kina ki uta, ki a mā tara tara ki tai. E hi akayana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hohu, ti hei mauriura. Excellent. I've got apologies uh, from Councillor Chu and Goff for lateness and also the Mayor um, for earlier departure as, as well. Um, I'll move that. Does someone want to call in? We'll do it best to be finished by then. Eh? Uh, I've got a declaration of interest from uh, Councillor Johansson on item 9 and also Councillor Templeton for um, one part of item 9, um, staff recommendation 1F. We might just need to clarify the, the number in there. Um, any other conflicts of interest? Excellent. Uh, confirmation of previous minutes from the 2nd of December. So Jake's moving it to a seconder. Sure. Sarah, thank you. Um, all those in favour? Aye. 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 Against? Carry. Uh, there are no public forums, deputations by appointment uh, or petitions. Move on to the first page. Oh, so, uh, item 7, the Central City Parking Restrictions Subcommittee Minutes. Uh, I'm happy to move that. Um, Jake will second. Uh, all those in favour? Aye. Opposed? Carried, thank you. Uh, item 8, the National Policy Statement on Urban Development uh, 2022 Work Programme. I'll ask David Emily to come forward and present this paper. Thank you. Kia ora. Um, so this report outlines the work programme and timelines for community consultation and council decision making for the district plan changes. Um, they're required to give effect to the National Policy Statement on Urban Development and the Enabling Housing Supply Bill. A range of plan changes are needed and will be decided this year. Um, we anticipate that the implementation of the NPSUD and the Enabling Housing Supply Bill will be of significant interest to our communities. There are aspects of this that do require decisions to be made and it's valuable for us to engage with our communities as early as possible on these matters. The proposed timeline for consultation and decisions is set out in the report with the first decision required on the 31st of March. By law, we are required to notify these plan changes by 20th of August, 2022. Therefore today, we seek your endorsement of the work program and the timeline set out. Thank you. Councillor Timberland's moved. Do I have a seconder? Tim, seconder. Is there any questions on the work program, Tim? Oh, Tim, thanks. Yeah. Uh, Tim, Tim, has got a question. Thank you. Um, some of the questions I'm getting from the community are around um, the area, character areas. So can you just explain, So, because we're being live streamed, the process, so, so the... the so we've still got to go, th when we make these changes, to go back to the government to have them accepted, or are they, or can we do this as a council? Because the, specifically people have you know, got moved to a character, or are lucky enough to be in a character area, but can, and they're worried about, say, um, two-storey apartments being built on their north boundary, that type of thing. Yes, so um, this is a new process that's been set out under the um, under the enabling housing supply um, legislation, and it's similar to a streamlined planning process. Um, the difference between the process set out and a streamlined planning process is that council has more decision making roles. Um, so the steps through this process will be um, appointing an independent hearings panel. Um, so the council staff um, evidence will go to that hearings panel. The hearings panel will make a recommendation back to council um, on 
the material that they've heard and the plan changes. Council then has the opportunity to accept or reject um, the recommendations from the independent hearings panel. The, if council accepts the recommendations from the independent hearings panel, then that is the end of the story there and it can go through as a normal plan change would. Um, for the matters that council uh, reject as recommended by the hearings panel, that then gets put forward to the minister to make a final decision. So the, the, that would be, say, if something is um, seen as adversarial to the NPSUD? So, so the, the, minister, the role that the minister will play will only be on matters where there is disagreement between council and the recommendation from the independent hearings panel. So provided that for, for the matters that council support and agree with the independent hearings panel, um, that won't then go forward to the minister. That will be finished. Okay, thank you. Jimmy? Okay, thank you. Uh, the uh, paragraph 5.3 regarding to the proposed uh, milestone and dates of this uh, program, a particular uh, focus on the pre-notification engagement and uh, notification engagement, this time period will be the kind of uh, overlap with the uh, uh, draft annual plan time period, whether staff consider can combine together for the engagement or, or consultation? Uh, the annual plan engagement um, is offered under separate legislation, so um, we would have to make sure that the engagement that we're providing is, is related to the Resource Management Act. Um, we are aligning our engagement periods as much as we can with other work programs um, to try and facilitate and, and um, provide that broader story to our communities. So, um, we'll be working with the comms team quite closely on how we manage to do that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yanni. Uh, thank you. And, um, you know, thank you for the suggestion that we do do pre-notification um, and engage our community. Can you give, just at a high level, a sense of the things that we'll be seeking feedback on? Uh, we, we're still working through those those matters, and um, and we will bring those to council. Uh, we have a briefing organised on the, the 1st of March, so we're just preparing our, our documents at the moment, and we'll, we'll take those through to you um, at a later date. Okay. Right, but just, uh, I think... The, <laughs> when you read this report like it it talks about the process around engagement and decision making but it doesn't give people a sense of what actually we're going to be asking people is it the areas that are fit for development is that basically the key thing that we're going to do which areas should have more intensification yeah so <laughs> so um so a lot of the decisions are prescribed um, as part of the NPSUD. So what we're looking at is where it's possible to make decisions. Um, some of those decisions are in the detail of how we implement the NPSUD, and some of those details are in the extent that we go when we implement the NPSUD, so how much we do. And that comes back to those conversations we were having last year on that do, do a little, do some, do a lot. Um, so, so there is an aspect of that, which is the kind of how far do you go, and then there is also some of the detail and how we implement it. Um, so. Yeah, but we, we are looking to bring um, the draft plan change uh, out for consultation. Um, it is a very tight time frame, um, so um, we will, we're endeavouring to put it to the public as much as we can. But yeah, as Emily has highlighted, it's actually quite a lot that is out of our control, that the NPSUD has already stated quite clearly we must do this, or the Enabling Housing Bill. So whilst we will be able to put stuff out to the public, actually, and we will make it very clear, this is what has uh, been determined by, by legislation, and this is where there is actually uh, uh, feedback will, will actually influence the decision. And, and, and unfortunately, that will be the smaller part. Um, a lot of this has already been determined, and you'll be able to read that through the legislation. Um, that you know, it's three stories, uh, three three per property across most of the city is is what the legislation says already. So um, it's a lot of this is already determined. Thank you. Uh, so, but I guess the sorry the, the the question for the I guess what I'm concerned about is if we go out for pre notification engagement, which which I support, that we're basically going to generate 
a whole bunch of submissions and engagement on things that we have no control over. So, so we're working very closely with the comms team on that um, and, and with our engagement teams to make sure that we are as clearly articulating that as we can to the public so that it's clear what they can engage on um, and what's going to add value to this process. And is there an option, the final question from me, is, is there an option just to let the government do this to us, given that it's pretty much what's been happening to date? Like, do we have to do this? Like, what happens if we don't do it and we say it's not something we agree with um, and, you know, if the government wants to do it, fine, they do it, but we're not doing it. No, this is a statutory requirement, so um, we, we, we have no choice. We, we must do it, um, and it would be up, up, up to the government to make a decision if we didn't do it, but um, we are required by statute to do it. Okay. Did you want to add something? Yeah. Yes, it may um, be helpful. Th there, are, there are a number of processes in the Local Government Act for the government to place a commissioner or replace the entire council if they're not complying with their statutory duties. So... That's the that's the reality. Is that one way or t'other it will be done? Yeah. Thank you, uh, Tim. Then Pauline. <coughs> um, look, you guys have uh, articulated it very well, but and I just want to reiterate, it's about when we you talk with our communications team, it's about t keeping the integrity of our, our consultation, and so I think f first and foremost we've got to make it clear what we're consulting on, why and what we can consult on, mm. because I think there's a lot of confusion about what what we can do and what we can't do. So I think that's absolutely paramount for what we do because there are going to be a lot of people that have wanted changes that we have no control on and we've got to make it clear what we're doing yep. and um, hopefully we'll raise a better understanding because there are a lot of people feeling like we've just been um, shafted and but there's different views on that but we've got to make it very clear from our side of things because when we do go out and consult <coughs> for other things, we've got to keep our integrity of what we can do. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the question, huh? Pauline. That was a brilliant <laughs> question. Um, <laughs> I'm just wondering, in the timeline, when does the independent hearings panel meet? Have I missed it? I can't find it. Uh, so the, the independent hearings panel um, hasn't been appointed yet. Um, the um, appointment and the, uh, the meeting will be following notification. So... Um, so somewhere after May... Uh, after the 20th oh, of after, August. Hang on. No, after... After this committee approves notification on the 7th of July, is that correct? Yes, yep. And then this thing comes into effect on the 20th of August. Oh, so the, the statutory deadline is, is simply to, to try and um, notify by the 20th of August. We're preempting that and um, going to the 7th of July um, Urban Development and Transport I thought week. it took effect from the 20th of August, these new rules. Uh, it will take effect from the um, date of notification, so when we when we notify, the documents will have immediate legal effect. But, uh, yeah, so just to clarify, so um, we must notify by the 20th of August, uh, then then the government is uh, wanting the hearings process and, and all the submissions process and everything to be done within a year of that, so by... Is it the 20th of August 2023? Um, the complicating factor is that the Enabling Housing Bill also says that the enabling housing provisions will have a legal effect from the 20th of August, mm. or, 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 or from the date of notification. So if we do it earlier, it'll be even earlier. Mm. So um, that will happen before there's any in independent hearings panel oh. process. So <clears throat> so the, the, the three stories, you know, three problems and three stories, um, as soon as council makes a decision that this is where that applies and, and that's notified, that will have legal effect so people can um, <coughs> will we'll be able to start using those rules. Um, the, 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 yeah. the, 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 there's a bit of a um, process that they'll have to go through uh, and that will be even before the independent hearings panel is met. So, um, yeah, things will start having effect pretty soon. So that's a hard one to explain to the public. It is, it is very hard, um, yes. And the other thing is that if we, when we um, agree to notify, which I assume that that's a compulsory decision we have to make as well, um, are we allowed to put our recommended, suggested changes in there at that time, and that that part that is notified? <clears throat> so, can we, in other words, can we notify our tweaked version? Let's say. 
Well, what, what, what we'll be putting to you is what um, what we must do, so what the legislation says yep. that we have no choice in. So we, we, we will have to do that. Yep. And then there'll be some areas where we can um, influence it. So essentially, I mean, the baseline is what the um, Name the Housing Bill has said, you know, three yep. stories everywhere. Yep. Um, essentially, I mean, there, there'll be some areas which will be have qualifying matters which um, we can have some but control on. But if the on. hearings panel decided to uphold some of our suggestions that we would pick up from the people of Christchurch when they, you know, feed back to us, that won't come into effect until possibly August 2023. That's right. And you yes. could actually say there'd be yes. a mad dash to, to run the full gauntlet in one year before any changes... Um, are reduced or any restrictions come in on, you know, anything. I mean, that's fair to say, isn't it? Uh, yeah, we're just working through that at the moment. What what will take legal effect this year and what will will go through the independent hands panel? But yes, there is. Yeah. Will be a complex time over the next year because you'll have different rules that have different legal effects. Okay, so can I just suggest yeah. that when we perhaps cobble something together for. Yep. The public that we perhaps do some sort of a flow chart or some yeah. sort of a visual because yes. I yep. even I'm struggling with this. Yeah. I've been reading Fair it enough. for months. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, it's Pauline Leanne. Um, the, the, the the real question is the qualifying matters because yes. that's where I think the meat lies, and I think a lot of people will want to submit on that, and mm. so um, sort of focusing the the encouragement for feedback from residents is around. The, the sort of technical elements of the qualifying matters. I, I, you know, I've just, I, I really would think that our council could bend over backwards to assist people to provide submissions that are um, helpful uh, to get those um, specific areas absolutely nailed down. Yes, yeah, yeah. The, 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 yeah you're right. The reason why there is more um, ability for council to, to make decisions is around qualifying matters and also the areas that will go above three storeys. Um, but in, in saying that, there is quite strict um, criteria in the legislation and in the national policy statement. So it's, 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 it's not completely open to have qualifying matters wherever we choose. There is, it is quite tight. So yeah. um, we've just got to bear that in mind. We, yeah. we, and, we might and the other point was the, um, you know, the landscaping requirements were changed in the, in the legislation. Yes. I think as a result of our submission and others as well, mm. but you know that's also going to have to be um, reinforced in the process. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, people I think do have a higher level of expectation mm. about you know areas that are just you know um, street by street without mm. those street trees and things like that. Yes. So, and that's maybe something we need to pick up in the tree policy. I mean, the the urban forest. It's not so much that, it's just the, the public round trees for new subdivisions. Yeah. Yep. Excellent. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any debate? I'll put that motion. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Any against? Carried. Thank you. Thank you. All right, item nine. Uh, the hearing panel report on the Kaura o Rakapo Norwest Arc Cycleway Section 3. Uh, Melanie, would you like to introduce that as the chair? Um, so we had the hearings panel for um, the Norwest Arc, which was um, between Island Road near the University of Canterbury and the Matson's Road and Herewood Road T intersection um, along Island, Aringi Road, Condor Ave and Matson's Ave. Um, you'll see the decisions um, on this are divided into different um, sections, um, including the um, Aoraki, Aorangi and Wairaki um, intersection. intersection. Um, the hearings panel went really smoothly. Um, everyone worked really well together and all of our decisions were, well, recommendations were unanimous. And you'll see that there were 426 submissions, so there were lots of submissions and there's a summary of those responses on page 30. Um, and then we had 29 oral submitters um, during the hearing process itself. Um, and then following um, hearing from those submitters, we um, the panel members submitted 60 questions. There was a lot of questions. Um, some were the same, but we got really detailed responses from staff, so thank you for that. 
Um, and then we were able to go on a site visit as well um, the week later, which was really good after hearing from the submitters. Um, and that was attended by everybody. Um, and you can see that um, Sam's put it together a really good report um, detailing um, everything that was um, discussed on, you see that on page um, 36. So I won't um, speak in any detail because you are able to read um, all the issues that were raised really. Um, the two sections that were the most um, difficult I guess or required the most deliberation were um, section one on Island Road between UC and Jolly Park about whether that was one-way cycleways or a bi-directional one. Um, and then the other one was the options around the Arangi Wairiki Road intersection. Um, and you'll also see in our recommendations at the beginning that we um, looked at particular issues that submitters um, raised, which was um, part of what we went through on the site visit. And that included things like the um, trying to retrain, retain the tree outside the medical centre on Island Road, widening the path alongside Jelly Park while um, still retaining the trees to create a bit more space, um, additional parking alongside the corner of Aarangi Road and Clyde Road intersection, um, and we also looked in detail at the entrance to 171 Wairiki um, Road too. So um, yeah, you'll see our recommendations, and also in 7.4, um, we've got a lot of the reasons there for why we came to the decisions um, that we did, and most of them were like, based around safety. So um, I guess I'll hand over back to staff um, for any comments you wanted to make or to answer questions. Thanks, Melanie. Is there any further comments before we go to questions? Not at this stage, Councillor. Right, so we'll go straight to questions. Pauline? Well, thank you. Because I see, I'm correct that the um, panel recommended option A in the two cases. Is that correct? And there was a, it's a million dollars extra for that, over and above the budget. Is that correct? That I'm is sure. correct. Yes. So is that a gross figure, or will the subsidy reduce that council's part of that spending? Mm. Mm, it's a council figure. Sorry. It's a council figure. Yeah, it's a council figure. So um, it is within the the Norway's ARC program, so that will be allocated. Okay. It's it's on budget. This is Crown funded, not NZTA funded. Oh, great. Okay. So um, the 10 and, 10 and a half odd million yep. is Crown money, and there's a million set aside in program budget that is that is on budget yep. and can be used. Great. And just um, with the, any trees that come out in the cycleways, um, particularly, I think perhaps anywhere in council, if we take a tree out, we replace it with at least one, but often more. It's to as per a new tree policy. Yeah, yeah, great. Thank you. Sam. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, just two two questions. So one of the recommendations is uh, K. So it's uh, be one K, which is request staff to monitor and report back on the impact of completed cycleways on the street parking. Can someone just clarify for me what we're expecting to see with that? Like, what what is the the point of that if we're removing it? We can't exactly put the parks back in. So what, what's the purpose? That's on the surrounding streets, isn't it? Yeah, that's on the surrounding streets. So um, so we have detailed figures for Island Road. It's more to do with the impact on the wider area and, and what it will do. So it's um, where the students obviously go and parks further away. Um, so we have the traffic counts that was and the vehicle parking that was submitted. Um, there's specific times in specific areas where it's fully occupied, but there are various other areas which is only um, event specific where it's parked up. So this is just to make sure that we do um, take note of it and just confirm the wider area and the implications. So we can assess um, whether it needs more parking restrictions maybe later. So parking restrictions being time restrictions, councillor? Yeah, okay, so we, we can't exactly put them back in, but that's okay. Um, and just the second one, and I don't know who this is best aimed at, and I'm wondering, and sorry, I can't see, but whether Andrew Kuhn is in the room as the, I guess, the council that looks after the hearings panels, but my initial understanding was that it was Jake, myself, and Simon Britton who were on it, and uh, as a result of that, our community board made a submission which conflicted the rest of them out of it. Uh, that, that then changed after... Uh, you know, from my understanding, there were some people that wanted to join with pretty strong views. Is Andrew able to potentially... No, no, we've got, staff, we've got staff, Sam, that can talk 
talk to that. Thanks, Megan. All right. <clears throat> so yeah, initially um, there was a hearings panel of three. Normally for a cycle way, which is fairly contentious normally, um, I, I probably would have done more than a panel of three to begin with, but my understanding was that um, the boards involved were all in agreement and, and that it wasn't potentially very um, contentious. Later found out that my understanding was possibly not accurate. Um, and, and so, yes, and an, another elected member asked to be on it. Um, and so I didn't have a problem necessarily with increasing it to five. Um, and then if, you know, there are some members that didn't want to be on it. So it, it, it was difficult in the end to get a panel of five. In hindsight, I should have gone with five to begin with. And I think from now on, that will be my minimum for any cycleways, regardless of whether I think they're going to be simple or not. So yeah, I should have done more than three to begin with in hindsight. Right, so, oh, okay, don't, don't worry. Sorry, What's did that things? not answer the question? No, it did, well, it was more a question for Andrew, because I, I mean, my understanding was that these all go through his office. No, but it's my, it's, between no, it's my delegation to appoint hearings panel members. So um, I work with Andrew Turner, um, Deputy right. Mayor, um, to, you know, to we, we sort of seek advice from each other and look at the, look at the makeup and... You know, we have we've got a, a lot of panels that we we work together on, but the delegation is actually with me. Right. So then, just the other one is if if there are hearings panels in the future where I have a particularly strong view, uh, there would be nothing to stop me coming and asking to be on that, like other elected members have with this one. No, absolutely not. No. But what I what I do need to do, and and I'd like to sort of uh, sorry at this point point out that on um, later on this month, I will be holding a workshop with elected members with councillors. Um, that, that was requested at the sustainability meeting last year about the value and makeup of hearings panel. So that is coming up um, about mid month, so we can you know traverse all these issues there. But um, when I'm and, and I can I can go over at that stage what I'm looking for when I'm putting a panel together. Um, so interest is is definitely one of them, and but I need to balance that with um, other views as well. And, and, yeah. and, oh, no, and Ma Megan, don't worry. I'm, I'm not getting it. I'm, I'm not getting it. You, you do. A, you do a great job. So that, that's fine. Thank you, okay. Jimmy. Thank you. Consider page thirty and thirty-two regarding those intersection the safety improvement by Rocky Raw or Rocky Raw because those oppose is more than the support. But I'm not showing sure here the hearing panel staff recommendation whether consider to install the synchronized intersection or not? Um, Councillor, yes, so um, it was considered and investigated. Um, it did, was discounted prior to consultation for the reasons as set out in the report. So um, we did a lot of early engagement with businesses, especially around the intersection, and we received a lot of feedback from them on, on the risks associated with the intersection the, their requirements with amenity, and then, as I mentioned, the, all the near misses that they've seen and they've been part of in that location. So it's um, coming back to the fully signalized intersection. Um, yes, we did. However, there are wider implications um, if that's installed and obviously pushing more vehicles um, on local roads instead of uh, minor arterials, which is designed for it. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jimmy. Phil. Thanks, guys. Just um, do, does everyone know, or does the public know about this yet? They don't. This will go out, and then it'll be in their eyes. It's been okay. No, that's right. No, does it? Does yeah? Okay. Yeah. Sorry, that's for me. So they're all general public is aware that the whole thing's going to be forty kilometres an hour all the way along. Um, correct. Yes. I suppose if they've read it. Yeah. So correct. from the university all the way up to the end on Hayward Road will be forty kilometres per hour. Correct. Okay. Well, one thing, was this a um, project that we got 10.5 mil for and it was already in the, in the system at 11.5, so we always knew right from the start that we had to put in an extra mil? No. So um, the reason for the, the options is through early engagement, we've obviously had a lot of feedback from residents, businesses and everyone, 
And that's why we went with the two options on both sections. So it was because of consultation or early engagement that we went out with additional options. However, the option A on both does incur higher cost um, due to the nature of the construction. So it wasn't envisaged at the start. It's through engagement that we came about with the options. And, so, and, sorry, and, and that was discussed with, um, with councillors in the committee prior before we went out to consultation. So we'd done early engagement and we got your feedback to say, should we go out with two options? Because one is more expensive and that was the guidance we got. Okay. Um, and just get going forward, knowing a little bit about how inflation's taking off and things are um, getting a damn sight more expensive, if you go out and price it, which you will, and it comes back at 12.5 mil, we will have to find the, the balance. The, t the government's only going to give us 10.5, nothing yep. else. So if yep. it came to 15 mil, we find the rest. If we decide to go ahead with it. If it, if it, goes, if it comes in at that sort of cost escalation, we'd be coming back and having conversation with the committee. Okay. Now, and one other thing, sorry, Mark. One other thing, the, just the other day, down by the Latimer Motor Lodge, where that cycleway comes into Latimer Square, we had a road and we put those things called sharrows on it. Is that what it is? Do the bikes ride down the middle of the road or are available to ride on the road? Why did we not just do that in Aorangi Road? Because Aorangi Road, to me, seems a lot quieter than... I can't remember. What, Gloucester, is it? Worcester. Gloucester. Um, so, so, sorry, so, Councillor, was... firstly, um, with the vehicle numbers, so originally, years ago, it was considered as a greenway. Um, however, the current vehicle numbers goes up to 4,000 vehicles a day on Aorangi Road, so it's actually not that quiet. All right. Okay. Um, and as part of the MCR standards, obviously, the separated cycleway. Um, to make it safer. So there are quite high numbers at the moment on our Rangi Road. So, but I just, it was considered as an option in, in the development of the design process. So we looked at all options through that but, development. Yeah, I'm sure you yeah. did. I'm sure yeah. you did. Yeah. Um, and uh, the other thing, the only, the, sorry, the last thing is out of the 190 submitters who said they preferred option A, which is fine, and that's what Melanie's gone with, do they have to come from the area or can they live in Timaru for argument's sake? Do they have to, if, if all the submitters who say, oh, this is so lovely. The, the, have you read the um, analysis of it? It's very clear where it goes to local community outside of that community. It, it, um, yeah, I've read that. Yeah, I've read that. Yeah. So, no, I just wondered. so in all of our consultation and all of our projects for all of our consultation, you don't have to be a local to provide your opinion on what it is. Uh, Some of these projects and these cycleway projects are like it. They affect people right across the city. They, there are people that, that, that live over in the hills and want to cycle to Kaiapui and they want to be on a separated cycleway. So people can have their opinion. What we do is provide you a breakdown of that analysis as we have in this report and we provided that to the hearings panel so they can then make a decision and wait that. That's not our job to wait that. I oh, know. No, That's yeah. the hearings panel's job to wait that. Okay, yeah. And they've done that and they've come up with their decision and they've asked us all sorts of questions along the way around that. Okay. So we try and give you that all that information so that you can make an informed decision. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Will. Uh, Sarah. Thanks so much. Um, really good to see how much early engagement there was ahead of the design coming out, which was um, really good to see. Actually, I've just got a, um, a question back for Megan, I'm afraid. Sorry. I'll pick up, she can go here. Yeah. Stay with. Yeah. Um, I just want to clarify once that once you decided to go to a hearings panel of five, how difficult was it to find councillors and were I'm not asking for names. Did people decline the opportunity to be part of the panel? Um, yes, some people declined, and yes, it was quite difficult. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Aaron? Oh, yeah, so just around um, our decision-making and the value of having a hearings panel is... Um, the most contentious part of the whole thing, well, other than the removal of parking down at Island Road, but the Aorangi Road, Wairaki Road corner. So the public have constantly gone to that local community board for decades, asking for traffic lights there uh, to cross it and use it safely for everyone. And then that gets discounted in this 
the hearings panel recommend against what the public say and the community board. So why do we have this process to get something that the community board and the public don't want? So I think from a technical perspective and the feedback that we got from the community, Yanni addressed that before by saying we engaged um, with those directly affected as to what they wanted. So I'll get Yanni to repeat that for you. Yeah. Correct. Um, so yes, a fully signalised intersection was um, presented to um, the businesses at the intersection about 10 years ago. And at the time it was voted against. So. There are a couple people that requested the fully signalised intersection. However, as per the report, obviously the majority actually did say that um, it's all about safety and they want a safety improvement and it's not necessarily just because of fully signalised intersection. And they wanted the amenity and they wanted to just improve you know, doing business in that area and the space the that they've got. The majority of submitters are against this left in left out versus no so a lot of feedback was um, concerns regarding the traffic and where the traffic will um, go on alternative routes and the modeling um, as per the technical notes address address that if you look at the report and and the figures there are less than it's between 10 and 15 people turning right at the intersection out of Arangi. Um, we need to remember Wairaki Road is over 20,000 vehicles a day and a fully signalised intersection will have big implications on Wairaki Road and cause delays um, because Aurangi is just a, a local road. So um, the, there's minimal movement through the intersection and right turn. So And there are multiple opportunities for the few people just to take alternative routes, whether it's Island Road or Creus Road or Jennifer Street. So it's um, so a lot of concerns out of the 25 that was objecting it was about the alternative routes and the implication that it will have on those streets. Well, I thought you said before there's 4,000 vehicles a day on Aurangi Road. On Aurangi, correct. Wairaki Road is over 20,000 vehicles a day. So that's the minor arterial where Aurangi Road is um, 3,700 just before the intersection. Yeah, and half a K north and half a K south, there's um, a set of traffic lights anyway. So when they're synced, they should all work it wouldn't affect Wairaki Road because it's not like it's a road with no traffic lights. It's already got traffic lights and some people say traffic lights are good because it gives a break in the traffic for kids crossing mid-block and things like that as well. Yeah, so with the, with the fully signalised, um, with the technical notes behind it was for safe crossing points as well as the amenity space and um, improving the connection between the businesses. With a fully signalised, you're introducing a lot more phasing and obviously, as soon as vehicles come from Aurangi and the phasing allowed for that, you'll create a further backlog on Wairaki. Which would just align with the other traffic lights on Wairaki. All, the, all of the details of this are detailed in the report. And it went through, we went through an extensive discussion with the hearings panel as well. Yep. Um, so was any my understanding done? Is that, yep. that My understanding is that what was the locals about equal and what they... Correct, yes. Yeah. So some locals have complained that they didn't get to submit on having, because it was never an option, to have a fully signalised crossing there. And I'm assuming, but maybe only assuming, but did the council ever model what, it would, what that intersection would actually look like with fully signalised? Because it may save some traffic flow from other people that rat run in the area currently because they could then get across airing I can safer. I can say that the team worked extensively on multiple options and before we went out to consultation, we came back and talked to you as a group and said these are the options and we talked about this intersection as well. Yep. Do you want us to go out with the fully signalised and, and your guidance was no, go with the safest option and go with what the pre-engagement was telling us. Yeah, but that's Everybody what... has had a chance to consult on the... Um, to, to provide their feedback that takes on me the back intersection. To my original point where uh, the community board, so the local community and the local community board wanted a different design, but you have a council table that has a majority uh, that wants to do something different to the city, 
rather than what the local communities want. So that brings us to this point. Sorry, Aaron, you just get into an argument with with staff and, and your facts aren't quite right. There was two community boards that actually board that intersection and they were split in their views, as was the locals that live on Ardrangan with 50% each, each way. Um, do you have a different question? No, no, let's keep Thank doing you. it to the people. Uh, Jake? Sam. Yeah, hey, thank you. Just one more for Megan, because I hate to feel you left with the wrong impression. Um, and just to clarify for Sarah, but the, so just so I'm really, really clear, when we moved from three to five to the hearings panel, that conflicted the rest of the community board, the Fingleton Waimari Hewitt community board, out of participating on that hearings panel, didn't it? Because they'd already submitted. Yes, because they had already submitted. And so you, you can't be a submitter. But not the councillors. And not the councillors. So you can't be um, on the submissions panel that puts in a submission to a council process. So that's the community board members and be on the hearings panel. But my understanding is that all the councillors sit back from all the submissions panels because you're here making a decision as well. Right, right. Oh, I just Any other questions? Thank you. Uh, just, I guess, one quick, well, a couple of questions from me. Just um, in, in terms of the, the intersection, and when you look at, um, if we just focus on actually the people that live on Aurangi Road, um, and there were 16 submissions, it was eight, eight for, for and against that intersection. Do you, do you think 16 is a good number? of submissions to receive um, for an intersection change like that? Like, I know there was a lot of um, pre-engagement with the businesses around there. What was the communications like with local residents as well? It's, um, yeah, so all the consultation material was hand-delivered to all the properties. Um, so, and we had multiple open days um, where public can um, give their views. So we've had, um, at least 30 a day that came and a lot of people we've discussed it although they might not have submitted we discussed them through the design um, and in especially around the intersection all the alternative routes that are, are available especially if you live close to the intersection and you need to get to the other side of the intersection however if you live closer to island road and um, there are multi multiple alternative routes so so although all of them might not have submitted we did have quite a feedback at the open days and we um, spoke to the public through the designs. Okay, thank you. Uh, and my other thing's more around the resolutions and resolution F. Is that actually a resolution or should they all just be? Or should F be pushed down to where G is? Uh, It probably should be written slightly differently to say section four is a title. Yeah, I, I just looked at the other one. But, like it, section. but, it, but it says the same as what the others say in the sense of it'll so, be a two way cycle ray on Arangi from Condal, uh, on Arangi, Condal, and Matson. So we're effectively going from Brookside Terrace to Hewood Road. So, so the first resolution says that the hearings panel recommend that they um, that the you uh, approve the um, the attachment A, and part of attachment A is that section four. So it's approving the the um, intersection improvement. No, that, that's that's fine. If it works as a resolution, that's yeah. yeah. So it aligns with the, the yeah. first part of the resolution. Okay, thanks, Sam. Just quite a long links. Okay, um, as chair of uh, Aaron. Yeah, just to follow up on Mike's question on the um, 848 against submitters on the intersection of Wairiki that are from Aorangi Road, were they ever given the option for a, a through crossing? Or is that only on the current design? No, it's on the consultation material, um, which is on the current design. Um, as we mentioned earlier, that was discounted through the negotiation or discussions and presentations to the community board, and um, we ended up just going with the one option at the intersection which was the safest option, which also had all the technical data behind it.
Melanie, as, as the chair of the hearings panel, would you like to move this? Do I have a seconder? Do you want to second even though you've got a conflict? Pauline, did you? Yeah. Hey, Pauline, okay, we'll go into debate. Um, do you want to open it, Melanie, or do you just want to close it? Okay, Pauline. Well, mine's very quick. I'd just like to remind people that these cycleways, the 13 MCRs, are actually one project and they're a metropolitan project. And we do look at, we do have to look at uh, the local piece, but we also have to look at the big picture. And I think as, as each one of these is implemented, the benefits increase uh, incredibly across the city. And I personally am getting a lot of incredibly good feedback on these cycleways. So um, just thank the team for the incredible work because I know they're complex. And I know that having worked very closely with the one of the first ones, the Papua New Parallel, that staff put in an incredible amount of time in that pre-engagement period because we know the benefit of doing that spade work first. Don't just launch in and make the thing. It's a, it's a huge amount of time. Pre-engagement, working with community boards, presentations, briefings, public drop-ins, consultations. It's, it's massive before we even start it. So just remember that it is a metropolitan project uh, the 13 MCRs, and once they're all done, uh, we'll get on to the connections, and our city is going to be so good as a result. So I'll be supporting this today. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else want to talk to this? Phil? Yep. Um, one thing I I do see here um, is where we are taking out... We, we can go out of our way and take out trees and replace them, which is great. We might take out one, we might put in five and replace them when we want to do things like a cycleway or anything else that council wants to do. But I've got residents queuing up at the door wanting to take trees out and are happy that they're replaced with two others and we don't we don't sort of listen to them the way we should, but we do it here. So I'm just saying that it's not equal. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Oops. So it's great to see how much early engagement went into the design ahead of the consultation and I think that what it's shown is that the feedback from the communities really takes that into account. It shows that the design that went forward was one that um, was broadly um, liked by the community which was really good and I'd like to thank staff um, heaps for their work on that and to the community for their really constructive and useful feedback. I'd also like to thank the hearings panel for their work on this. It's really not easy with a significant number of submissions, the hearings, site visit, deliberations, and to come to unanimous decision on the design is really heartening. So thanks to Councillor Coker for chairing the panel, to Councillors Davidson, McClellan and Chu, and community board member Simon Britton. There's plenty of research and evidence on the benefits of cycling in cities, both internationally and here in Aotearoa. The National Transport Agency, Waka Kotahi, lists these as more livable towns and cities, improved conditions for travelling within towns and cities, stronger local economies, reduced costs for council, less impact on the environment, and healthier and more productive people. We also know that providing cycling infrastructure responds to what a significant percentage of people say they want. NZTA, re NZTA research shows that 60% of urban New Zealanders view cycling as a great way to get around towns easily and efficiently. And one quarter of new urban New Zealanders have cycled in the past year, with 20% of those being commuter trips. 70% are supportive of cycling in their communities. Internationally, a new study involving over 100 European Union cities shows that new COVID-era cycling infrastructure has already grown cycling rates by 11 to 48% on, in the cities, which could generate between $1 and $7 billion in health benefits alone if the infrastructure is kept. Research by a health sciences expert at Simon Fraser University and published in the International Journal of Behavioural Nutrition and Physical Activity has shown a direct correlation between cycling infrastructure and a rise in those switching to commuting to work by bike. We have seen that play out in Christchurch, with increasing numbers of people biking around the city. Cycle trip numbers into the central city have increased 80% since counts began in 2016, and importantly there's been an increase in the number of women cyclists counted, 41% up um, compared to 2016 with 32%. Over 20% of our population aged 16 plus do not have a driver's licence. And sales of bikes, especially e-bikes, are booming, especially in our older populations who are keeping active much later in life and loving the cycleways. There are those who simply can't see themselves on a bike, but the evidence is clear that many people do and many more would given safe infrastructure. 
compromising on safety means that we don't see the benefits that we could do. And while it would be great to have a standard design that we pop into every street, the reality is that our streets aren't standard and that engaging with our residents has led to changes in the early design and an excellent hearings panel process. It's a truism, you can't make progress without change. And if we're going to become a sustainable 21st, city, 21st century garden city, we need to make decisions that will head us in the right direction. Thank Status you. quo is not good enough. Jamie, did I see you put your hand up? Yeah, yeah, I, I just want to signal that I, I wanted to speak to yep, it. Yeah, you can speak to it, James. Uh, thanks. Look, all, all I really wanted to say is, you know, thank you, obviously, to the hearings panel. But I, I, I think with this, this is a classic case of perhaps uh, a plan that's well-intentioned that uh, has a, a significantly detrimental impact or the, uh, and the level of unintended consequences um, far outweigh uh, the, the benefits to, to this community. And, and I, you know, I note through the consultation um, you know, the, the questions that were raised by, by Councillor Major there. And I think we sometimes have a propensity to look at this as like a first-past-the-post system. And I think what really shouldn't be lost in this is the weighting of local knowledge, uh, community board and residents, you know, when you go through these consultation processes where someone on our Rangi Road, for example, is going to uh, have uh, more credibility, in my opinion, than, than someone that perhaps lives in Timaru or may or may not use this cycle way. The, the one thing, because I'm conscious of time, that I do want to bring up, you know, is the banning of the right-hand turn onto, um, from our Rangi Road. And, and I think what's really clear with this is that this is just going to result in significant amounts of vehicles rat running through local streets that are just not designed to be able to cope with that increased um, volume of traffic. So uh, I don't know where the data is that supports the fact that people genuinely want to be cycling down our Rangi Road, or, but I strongly suspect that there's going to be more vehicles that are now forced to rat run uh, off our Rangi Road than there will be cyclists actually using the cycleway. So I just want to go back to the fact that I think that this is systemic of something that's well-intentioned, but carries with it far more unintended consequences. I think the best uh, course of action, the only sensible course of action, is to send this back to the drawing board, and I will not be supporting the recommendations. Thanks, James. Anne. Uh, kia ora, thank you. Um, I'd, all, I'd like to acknowledge uh, particularly the thorough and expert knowledge um, of our staff, which has been evident in their patient responses to um, elected members' questions, who are needing to be reminded of the fact that they were involved in the decision-making process all the way through, and that staff were given the direction to go with the safest option. And we see this in what we are considering today. It's interesting um, that 12, only 12% 12 of submitters were opposed to this plan. And um, of those, 29% uh, of university students, who will be the majority of people who will use this, um, were saying that they would cycle more if they felt safe. This is all about safety. And uh, we have before us a great plan that had unanimous um, support and a recommendation from our hearings panel, and which I am delighted to support today. Thank you. Is there anyone else that wants to talk? Aaron? Yeah, I uh, just want to raise, raise a couple of things here. Um, and uh, I, uh, when, when this was first shown to the community board, there was certainly aspects of it the board got quite excited about. We actually embraced a number of aspects of the cycleway and the design. Um, uh, but then we had issues with other parts of the design, some of the removals of parking down Island Roads, a clear one, and the other one is the intersection of Aorangi Road, Wairaki Road, uh, where we were clearly told by our people what they wanted, and they were never consulted on that. Um, it's, there's a lot of stats and things being pulled out at the table today, and of course the usual S word being used. Um, safety, uh, which is a shame when you use safety all the time to try and scare people into more cycleway infrastructure because cycling is not dangerous. It is not a da We need to stop telling everyone cycling is dangerous and trying to talk people into getting infrastructure because cycling is so dangerous. Cycling is actually fun and cycling is actually cool and you can go out and have a good time on a bike uh, and, and it's a great way to see places. It's a 
great way to go meet people, it's a great way to get to work, but that's not the way we're selling it. And I think this council's failed in the last 10 years since we started doing our major cycleways program. The numbers by now should be at least double what they currently are. And if this was a business model and we were spending that much money and getting those kind of returns, everyone would be fired. Uh, it'll be like if you're on the board of Westfield and someone will go, why did you put the Westfield in Darfield? It didn't work. Of course it didn't work because you didn't sell it right and you put it in the wrong location. People of Christchurch feel like the cycleways are being done to them whereas we should have taken them on the journey and we should have people chomping at the bit to be getting cycle infrastructure in their neighbourhoods. Uh, the numbers are going to plateau uh, because you'll get to a certain number because we've scared others off cycling. Uh, on average, 10 people a year in New Zealand die cycling. 36 people die as pedestrians and 115 people drown. 300 odd are killed in cars, 900 of suicide. But we don't call a lot of these other things as dangerous. Parents aren't making their kids wear life jackets at the beach because they're so scared, but they won't let them bike to school. Stop calling cycling uh, dangerous. Start making cycling fun. Make it more acceptable. Take the public on the journey. This council's created its own bike lash, and that's why there's so many people that when they ha are forced to rat run around streets and people see behaviour change like that, it's the wrong behaviour change. And it is easy to get an economist to look at our numbers and say that the decisions we're making are actually increasing our carbon footprint. So stop patting yourselves on, your, on the back and get out and let's make some changes to the city to actually make cycling fun, popular and cool, which is what it should be, because it's not dangerous. Thanks, Aaron. Anybody else? Um, I'll, I'll, before you wrap up, Mel, I'll just say a couple of couple of things. Like I'd like to thank staff as as well. Um, it was an excellent pre-engagement, which actually helped shape the the design. You know, going out to community groups, residents, businesses, um, really helped shape the design, um, which ended up with two two design. Um, and they obviously had guidance with with count from councillors as as well. Um, so I was actually quite pleased to see the bi-directional one come through as, in the, as a consultation um, part. I um, was actually quite surprised with the result. I've actually always been quite keen on bi-directional bi cycleways, so I was quite surprised actually with the result of the consultation. Um, I, I would have thought there would have been a lot more supportive of, of bi-directionals, but it's actually clear that people would prefer, prefer to go on the one-way cycleways, um, which, which is good to see. And, and so bi-directionals have the place, and so do one-way cycleways, and it's ensuring that we get these in the, the right place, and I think we've done this with, with this design. Um, you know, it's quite interesting when you look at some of the um, results of the consultation and section, when you look at the local community, um, how they were affected, you know, it was pretty much split down, down the middle. Um, so, you, you know, it's, it's always the way, you know, half the people are gonna love us and half the people aren't. And it's, it's, it's a shame. Um, but I think once we, when you get these things implemented, they actually start to realize actually they are quite good and, and valuable. And we're seeing that across the city now with our cycleway infrastructure that's going in. Um, and then people are getting on them and they're actually really enjoying biking, um, which is great to see. Uh, the Norway Stark, which already has quite a bit completed on it, is actually a really good route for people on that side of, of town. Um, and I've had a lot of positive comments about it um, and a lot of people looking forward to that link right across. Um, Arangi Road as well is, is a local road. It's already well over what should be going on there. Um, so I think that community will benefit with a reduction of, of cars um, and a much more better amenity for them as, as well. Um, so look, thanks to the, to the hearing panel. It was, a, it was a good panel to be on. It was good to represent um, the community on, on there, and I, I think we came out with a good good out, outcome, and I'm, I'm be hopeful that all councillors will support it, but I, I don't think that will happen, but I'm sure we'll get a good result, so thank you. Mel. So I just wanted to um, quickly sum up. The hearings panel, we went into this with a completely open mind. I think um, we were all 50-50 on where we were sitting, um, with decisions on all the sections actually until right at the end. Um, we listened to all the submitters and we asked many, many questions so we could make the fullest decision possible. 
and any decision we made could have been different if a member of the panel had had a differing view. But this didn't happen, and it resulted in a unanimous um, result and recommendations. This Norwest Arc means that once it's complete, anyone from Kashmir, Hoon Hay, Summerfield, Spaden, my area, um, could bike safely all the way to Papua Nui. With the university being a key employer, as well of, of course for the students, many of which are young, but not all, safe cycleways to and from this location are incredibly important. Once this is complete, those from Papua Nui could bike, bike um, through to the university safely. This is not only increases the equity of accessibility, but increases safety and is another step in our progress towards mitigating and adapting to climate change. The decision around the Aorangi Wairaki intersection is the right one in my opinion. Um, putting in a full signalised intersection would dramatically increase the traffic on Aorangi Road, decreasing its safety, and it would result in the stalled traffic on Wairaki Road that um, the staff mentioned earlier. And I also find it exceedingly disappointing, actually, that some of the councillors against the proposal refused to be on the hearings panel when asked, so they could take the opportunity to attack it at the meeting today rather than be on the panel putting forward these recommendations. I encourage councillors to support the panel's recommendations with the safety of everyone, but particularly our young people in mind. Aye. Yes. Yes. Can they turn the microphone on? We can't hear. Yeah, I'm just wondering if the secretariat could have their mic on. We should have all mics on during a division. Councillor uh, Cotter. Aye. Councillor Donovan. Yes. Councillor Davidson. Aye. Councillor Galloway. Yes. Councillor Goff. No. Councillor Johansson. Oh, I've stood back from this. So. Councillor Kewan. No. Councillor McDonald. No. Councillor Major. No. Councillor McClellan. Yes. Councillor Scandrit? Aye. Councillor Templeton? Aye, though abstaining on F due to conflict. The resolution passes 11 to 4 with one abstention from Councillor Johansson. Sorry, uh, I'm not an abstention. I just, I haven't participated. I've stood back from the table. So... Thanks, thanks, Gianni. Okay, um, so that's carried. I'm now going to vacate the chair and let Tim chair the last three items, which are papers that would have previously gone to the Regulatory Performance Committee, which he chaired. As Mike just explained, the reason the last three items and why I'm here is that we are winding up the Regulatory Compliance Committee and morphing it into the um, Urban Development and Transport Committee, which makes total sense. So, um, just want to um, remind councillors that we are in <coughs> difficult times, puts pressure under our community, all of our communities and our staff, and um, these teams are at the forefront of this. And so just, I'm just going to take these as red so you'll also understand and be able to see the high standard of um, uh, acceptance from our um, communities and the um, high level of satisfaction that our teams are maintaining in these hard times. So I will pass over to Buster for item 10 on that. Uh, kia ora. good morning councillors. 
Um, just working through the, f um, the figures that we've presented to you, um, I suppose it's been pretty well publicised, the workload that we're undertaking, and these figures do, particularly in relation to building consents, do represent quite a change from where we've been over the last four or five years in delivering our service within a timely manner. Um, the construction sector is under a, a huge surge and pressure at the moment in terms of uh, materials, the supply chain and resources, and we're subject to those impactors as well. Having said that, um, it's pleasing for me to see that uh, and present that our consents that aren't started have dramatically um, decreased uh, and continue to do so, and that our uh, performance in terms of um, statutory days and KPI is actually on the on the rise uh, as a, as a whole for the financial year to date. Um, notwithstanding the building consents, the other parts of our business that are just as critical in terms of undertaking inspections, um, issuing code compliance certificates, uh, the performance is strong. And those areas are under just as much pressure as the consenting. Um, this this turn represents a significant effort from our team, who have uh, done a magnificent job in tackling all this work. And I, and I just wanted to share this number that isn't actually in this report, but I just got it zipped off before. For the previous three years, to this time in the financial year, so the first seven months, um, the value of work that we've um, consented for the district has been around the $1.1 billion mark. Uh, at this point in time, we're just about to tick over, for this financial year, $2 billion worth of new building work. So that's a heck of an effort from the team and also the complexity of the work is changing. So when I look at the complexity for us, commercial is down, but high-end residential, particularly in terms of apartment construction, um, the previous three years for the first seven months have seen the value of that sort of work at around the um, $300 million mark. For the first seven months of this financial year, we're just about to hit $800 million worth. So some significant changes in value, which represents complexity, and complexity uh, is, uh, is, is heavy workload. So there's a lot in the, in the data. It's pleasing to see um, from our perspective that the sector is still confident uh, we love seeing new buildings built. We're from that sector. Um, and we love getting them uh, approval to, to go ahead. So I think those numbers are, are, are quite significant. And they are very similar to what other areas are also experiencing in terms of heavy workload, but buoyant uh, construction sector. I'm happy to take um, any questions. Thank you, Buster. Um, could I just remind staff, uh, sorry, um, councillors to um, give the page number and item number when you're asking a question, please, just to make it a bit quicker. And I'll take Jamie first. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. And, and, and thanks for that, Buster. Look, I obviously appreciate the enormous um, pressure that, that you and your team are under you know, to respect to building consents. But I guess my question is really around, and it's in light of the fact that the people that are impacted, I guess, by that, you know, also feeling the pressure, uh, namely in, in their pocket as it costs thousands and thousands of dollars. And I guess the you know, failure to meet our statutory timeframes, you know, will have potentially cost millions of dollars um, for, for people. Though that being said, what I don't get a sense of in the report is um, when do you likely see uh, the timeline for us to be able to be meeting our statutory requirements? And I suppose I just wanted a bit more commentary on how you see the path out of this. And the other one, and just a supplementary to that, is something that I'm, it might be a silly question, it probably is, but what actually happens when we don't meet our statutory timeframes? What, what's the consequence to us as a, as a regulatory authority? 
Um, just to answer the, the first question, there, we're an impactor um, along with a lot of other th uh, things in terms of that supply chain and resourcing. So it, it is hard to be definitive in terms of what our impact on cost is, but people have talked to us about that. When people talk to us about that, we look at our situation and try and expedite uh, those the, the best way we can. Uh, we reported previously how we have implemented a number of streams of work. Um, they, they are now flowing uh, quite efficiently in terms of a lot of the smaller workers getting turned around in three to five days. Variations to consents where people are having to change are getting turned around uh, really efficiently. And a, a lot of those uh, uh, complex um, housings, if they're in, uh, in a particular stream, will also go through um, within the 20 day time frame. So that's having an impact. Um, in terms of when we will get back to where we need to be, there's a couple of big ifs, and it depends on the continuing volume of work. Um, I can't tell you whether that's going to increase or decrease. My feeling, and the feeling is drawn from discussion with a number of commentators and stakeholders in the sector, is that we'll see a, 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 a bit of a flattening of the market uh, this year. Um, money may be a wee bit more uh, difficult to come across to, to buy buildings, so that may um, introduce a, a, a flattening. But you know, from what we've seen in the past, there's a, a lot of guesswork involved. Talking to um, my colleague Metro Councils, who have been in this situation and had to you know, have bottomed out with performance and had to increase it. They've all commented on that it's incredibly hard to increase performance any more than 5 to 7% per month. So at the moment, end of January, we're just hitting the, the 40, we're hitting back up to the 40% in the 20 working days. So, you know, if you, if you take that formula, and apply the a, a reasonable number of flattening consents. Maybe we might better squeeze a wee bit more out in terms of increased percentage, but it could take the likes of um, you know six months for us to be hedging back up to uh, a much better better level. Um, in terms of what happens to us, um, we are have been in, uh, engaged with our co-regulator in terms of where our performance is at. Um, they are aware, we've, we've just last year had a very successful accreditation assessment, so they know our, our systems and our procedures and our people are all fit for purpose. So there's great confidence there. Um, the pressure on the sector is not just here, it's everywhere and more and more uh, councils are becoming susceptible to that. So there's a good awareness from, um, from, our, from our regulator um, and on that basis I, I don't see there being any issue for us. We need to continually improve. Um, those circumstances can change depend on our resourcing levels for example. There's regulations in play that we have to report on in terms of how many people leave per quarter and the like. So depending on the situation, um, as long as we're making good progress, I think that um, uh, the, the communication pipeline remains open and they'll see us continually improve. Thank you um, it, It's important. You might have asked a supplementary on that, Mr Chair. Pardon? You might have asked a supplementary on that. Just Buster raised an interesting yep. point that I just wanted to tease out a wee bit. Um, so two, two things there. Um, firstly, I appreciate that this isn't isolated to the Christchurch City Council, um, but one thing you know that I find really useful is, is benchmarking. I think I need to quickly say before this, uh, and with the greatest respect, I don't really give a toss, you know, if other councils are, are failing or not, because I'm not paid to worry about them, uh, and neither are you <laughs> or anyone else. Though that being said, I think it does give us an indicator and in help planning. Um, around how we can get out of this and look after our residents, you know, and make sure that our business is on the right trajectory. Um, where do we sit as far as benchmarking goes? Obviously, year to date, we've got about 37% of uh, building consents processed within, um, you know, nine or 19 days. 
um, where, where does that sit, you know, across across the country, appreciating the pressure could throughout I, New Zealand? Could I just, um, with regards to other um, towns and also, and Buster, you'll be able to um, add to this, with regards to outsourcing um, consents, if other um, cities who we have gone to in the past and outsourcing to private organisations and companies, if they are under pressure as well, which is all in the... With, it is in the report with regards to the outsourcing to companies. If they are under pressure, that minimises our ability to to um, outsource to up our, our game. But Buster, you can comment, I'm sure. Um, in terms of outsourcing work, the the market's really tight. I mean, uh, you know, we we get asked to help other people out, other councils out with certain types of consents. But, uh, you, you know, uh, last year we embarked on uh, 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 strengthening our outsource um, capability and, and the cupboard's pretty bare, really bare, you know. Um, yeah. So we are doing the best with what we can get. I don't know of any stone that we haven't um, lifted in terms of uh, external support. Um, I think... I, I don't think I asked my question properly. I, I, my question really was, you know, we're processing for industry but 27% of, um, of uh, the consents processed within the statutory time frame in December, 37% yet today. I guess what I'm really asking is, what are those equivalent figures for, say, Auckland, Wellington, and other sort of uh, similar territorial authorities? Where do we sit? Well, could... Are they significantly better or worse than us? Because I have no sense of that. Well, if... Do you want to take this offline? Yeah, um, get that out to all councillors, perhaps, so we've all got the. Just I'd benchmarking like, is pretty yeah. mental. Although it does seem strange if you don't care about the performance of other councils, but they have been low no, and they're about no, I'm saying I'm not, can, what can, I'm saying, What I'm saying is I'm not going to spend my time trying to fix their problems, but I, I think it does sorry. give us a sense no, of how I, we're tracking. Can I just say just that? To make them yeah. Um, the staff can send that information out to councillors in an email. If that's okay, Buster. Well, we, we'll have to extract that data, data failing, from them. Because we're failing, I want yeah. to be part of the solution. Yeah. Well, I, but it has uh, been we made. We should all be very worried. Jamie, Jamie, Jamie thank, you. thank you. Thank Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. So, Buster, you, if you can get that information out, um, I think it's pretty clear that our staff are doing the best job they can and they're staying in communication with those companies and those individuals that are under pressure. And I think that's um, reflected in the satisfactory um, standards that we're getting back that is also in the report. So are there, anyone else got any questions? Um, Phil. Thanks, Buster. That's good. Um, I was talking to one of the larger um, building companies in town that, that does a lot. They're more than happy with how fast you guys, and they know you're under pressure and how fast you're getting stuff through. One of the problems they've got is because they do separate titles with a lot of their buildings, they're running into a bit of strife with getting the, I'll get this right, the stamped plans from subdivision. So when they get to the point that they have to put it in for 2D3 or 2D4, they've got your bit right and they've built it. And you could say that they've actually started laying the pipes before they've got the stamped plans, which I would never do. Um, <laughs> um, but it's causing them grief because they're finished and they can't have the stamped plans to put it into the next stage. Where, where could we tighten up on that or assist that department, I don't think it's your department though, is it? No. Okay. So who, whose department is it? Possibly the... <laughs> I'll talk to you later, that's right. Possibly John's, yeah. Yeah, okay. But there'll, but there'll be, a, but there'll be um, a number of influences across the... the I'm sure, oh, no, yeah, thing. I know. But that, that was just one thing they said. They're, they're more than happy with what you're doing, but they are struggling with this last little bit because they get Good it finished it. and they can't get them sold because that's when they get their dough. Yep. So that's right. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Um, who else had a question? Oh, sorry, um, Jimmy. You. Okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you for the report, the comprehensive report. 3.1, the key statics, uh, the start down the greater job, particular, I'm impressed. Uh, you have an uh, inspection book within three working days in the, over the, the standard target. And also customer satisfaction, uh, particularly in this COVID, still you know more than uh, your original target seventy five. But my question is ex regarding to the you mentioned workload, you know, too heavy, so many uh, number of buildings. 
but but whether the COVID have affected those the figure, particular those the uh, building concern position with the working days or code compliance certificate decision, whether affect COVID affected these two categories or not. Look, when, when uh, I suppose in terms of our efficiency, yes, the 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 impact has been minimal. You know, um, yes. at this point in time now, whether we're in the office processing consents or we have yes, staff yeah. at home processing consents, I'm very confident that our efficiency remains in in play. Okay. So m minimal impact there. Obviously, inspection numbers will be impacted depending on whether we can get into building sites. Yes. Um, depending on previous when we've had lockdown or or, or not. Yeah. Um, but it, it it is hard to. Uh, monitor, gauge, and forecast yes. those impacts. Okay. Can Sorry, I just, see, see, second question. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. Sorry, um, councillors, just to add to that, with the um, Omicron yes. um, variant coming up, there is a risk that we will lose more staff to illness yes, yes, over the next okay. period. So that is a risk. Yeah. And um, we're planning for that as best we can. Okay. Um, but that's just a signal that over the next two or three months, we okay. may see that that will be an impact on our ability to yeah, respond. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Second one, regarding 3.1, the two figures, you know, category building concern uh, uh, process within 19 days, and also your core compliance of speaker decision. These two year to date, the, the percentage, in my view, should be the proportional, same ratio. But why the, your core compliance certificate is so still very high, 86.9 percentage, I thought it should be relatively low. If we review the, those the building concern policy within 19 days, so I just don't know what's the rationale. You know. So the, 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 the code me. compliance represents the end of the process. Yes. So consent approval to start inspection throughout the project and code compliance sign off at the end. So it's a, they, there can be quite a lag between um, consent volume and code compliance volume depending on how fast the sector is building buildings. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, thanks, Robert. I just wanted to kind of acknowledge that um, this is your first time presenting to the full um, committee of the whole. But So thank you very much for doing that and, and taking um, questions from us. Obviously, it's an issue that's near and dear to all of our hearts. Um, it's a um, when you have an indication that there's an increased... Uh, workload coming and it's hard to scale up the workforce to match. Um, uh, I guess my question is, is that this is looking back to December, you know, has January represented an opportunity to do a bit of catch up? Yes. So look, looking, if I was reporting on the end of January, for example, um, in the commercial consenting area alone, we've seen our 20 day compliance jump up from 45% to 66%. So that, that's a, a, a really good um, sign for me and why I talk about the, the worm turning. Uh, also in terms of the residential processing, it's jumped up from around about, uh, just on residential consents, 29% up to 37%. So all, all, all of the indicators- They're in the right direction. Volume yeah. slightly decreasing, backlog significantly decreasing, performance increasing. Yeah. I'm, I'd, I'd like to be bold to say that the breeze is, our sails up and we, we, we need that bit of wind, um, but we're going in the right direction. And um, in terms of your earlier comments, of course, it's a pleasure to um, <laughs> present to everybody. It happens to be my birthday, sort of wonderful gift um, <laughs> for my employer to be scrutinised by the elected members. <laughs> We're all thinking of you, Robert, so, you know. So. Oh, well, happy birthday. Yeah. <laughs> happy birthday. Yeah. But um, so. uh, just the, the, the other thing was that um, in terms of the uh, communication with people when they lodge their consent, so they've given an indication that um, we're experiencing these, these yeah, delays. In a number of areas, and I think that communication is uh, represented in that reasonably high satisfaction. Right. So um, yeah. a, a lot of people communicate to us that they're, not happy with the delay, but they're happy with the communication. 
Right. And so just finally, if, if there's, you know, particular cases that, that come in where they where they respond to that communication and say, oh, no, this is urgent because I've got X, Y, Z all lined up, does that, d- d- does that help you prioritise the work that's coming in? Of course it does, unless everyone responds that way. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but from a genuine point of view, if, if there is a specific reason, then, then there is an ability to... You, you know that we've learned well from our experiences in the earthquake that there's always got to be situations that need um, just as much empathy as they do technical competence and efficiency applied. And, and we try and use that rule of thumb as much as we can. Yeah. I have to say I've been really impressed with the um, approach to making personal contact and offering personal contact details so that people can connect along the way. So. Thank, Thank you. you very much for the changes that you've brought in and good luck for how we go with the next report. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Leanne. Um, Celeste. Kia ora, thanks for that and also happy birthday. Thank um, you. I was just wondering in terms of looking ahead with changes to the Housing Resource Management Act and in terms of the staff capacity because I'm assuming that that will lead to a bigger spike in applications. Do you anticipate any problems on that front? Because I suspect that'll require some different thinking about how to manage. It, it, it's a it's a really interesting lens to put on, and, and I, I I take it that you're referring to some of the relaxation with three units, three stories high type thing. I think in reality, um, when I talked about um, the um, the complex housing, we're already seeing that. Um, I. I I, it's all about a guesswork. We can connect with our stakeholders um, that we know and ask them about their intensification from it. The, the people we talk to about that aren't anticipating a huge surge because they're already doing this work. I think these numbers reflect that. They're just getting consents to do it. The claim will be they don't need a consent to do it. Whether it will necessarily generate in a uh, proliferation of these around um, our suburbs is just guesswork at the moment. It's, it's got to come down to a number of factors. So, uh, and, and it won't just be an impact uh, on building instead, it'll be an impact right across the council in, in terms of you know network capacities, roading capacities, uh, planning capacities, uh, transport capacities. There's going to be a, a big impact right, right across the council. Um, and I don't think we're certain that um, it is going to hit us in the face like this wave has, you know. Um, and it's difficult to prepare for it. We're, my unit's basically um, consent fee funded, so I can't. it's difficult for me to recruit people and have them sitting around there waiting for work to arrive. Who, who pays for them? So, you know, that's where we need good... Uh, consenting outflow, but likewise, the um, consultants and people who help us with that work can't be sitting there waiting for work either. So it's a it's a bit of chicken and egg, but certainly one that we are, I feel well, we're pretty well connected to the market to have those discussions to see where their, where their workflow is going. So we meet with a lot of those stakeholders, particularly, you know, the sort of like the top eight developers and the like to see, you know, where their work's tracking. Sorry, just a quick follow-up. The reason I ask is because I've heard from people working in this space that they are concerned. So it's the not necessarily in this organisation, but staff in general. Um, and they've said that they are struggling and therefore they're concerned. So that's from within the kind of area of people processing the applications that they think it's going to be challenging. So I'm just flagging my concern that that's yeah. something that we... It, like you said, we can't necessarily anticipate, but we might want to consider how we're going to deal with that as an organisation to make sure we're not putting additional stress on staff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the staff are already under a lot of pressure. I'm, as a, the point I'm making, I think we're already seeing that work and we're responding to it now. Whether there will be a huge change when the relaxation uh, from the RMA requirements come in is, is what I'm not... Um, I, I'm. I'm not clear on, I suppose. Yeah, we're not hearing a big... The sector's not seeing a, a bigger change than what they're doing now. I think they're probably at their capacity. Mm. Yeah. Thank you very much. Any further questions? 
Okay, and I'll, I'll show me a second. So, um, all in favour of receiving a report? Aye. 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 against? Abstentions? It's carried. Thank you very much, Robert. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> now, item 11. Um, Marina Tracy. So uh, I'll let you uh, introduce. Kia ora, councillors. Um, good morning. I hope you're having a good day. Um, so as the report reads, this is an information um, only report and it highlights the activities of the regulatory compliance unit um, for the Dece November, December period. So it's a, a bi-monthly report. I'm just going to take this off because it's hard to speak to you all. Um, <laughs> it's a bi-monthly report and so it doesn't capture January, but we're a bit behind the eight ball. Um, and it um, covers off our levels of service up until the end of December. So the highlights um, that my team have been focusing on, which are a lot of seasonal highlights, um, typically the Freedom Camping campaign kicks off in, on the 1st of December and that takes us through to the 30th of April this year. Um, and it has, we provide a, I hope I'm not going over old ground for you all, but I thought I'd give you a wee bit of an um, update. We provide um, a education, monitoring and enforcement approach to Freedom Camping. So we have um, an educational approach in the evening and then an enforcement approach in the mornings. So we have officers working up till 10, 11 o'clock at night uh, providing education so people know what they're supposed to be doing and then we go and check that they are compliant with what's required in the mornings. Um, we, this season has also brought into play the changes to the bylaw, and I've detailed those within the report, so I hope um, you've all had an opportunity to have a read of those. Uh, to date, the, the freedom camping season has run really, really smoothly. Volumes are low, as you can anticipate. We don't have the international travellers like we normally would. Um, it is all national travellers. And um, the consistent numbers with last season, though, because it's a current situation, it's not different from last season. Uh, the key areas um, of activity have been along Marine Parade and Akaroa in the Banks Peninsula area, which are, again, similar to the previous year. Um, campers do tend to like to flock to the coastal areas, um, which is also understandable. Uh, we have been issuing infringement notices where we've found non compliance and um, as of December, we had 15 infringement notices issued for non-compliance of um, the camping requirements. Uh, this year was the first year we ran a proactive campaign in relation to um, pool safety. And um, as within the report, you can see this has been really well received. Uh, we've had a lot more visits to our websites, about 2,000 more visits between the period of uh, show weekend and the 20th of December, which is typically when people are starting to purchase pools and getting ready for the summer holidays, um, which is a 70% increase on our website hits last year. So the campaign has been really positive and um, we've had an increase in compliance and we can't attribute it all to the campaign, but we do believe that it has factored into the education of people knowing what to do and what types of pools to purchase and what they need to have fenced and what they don't need to have fenced, which is typically the problem we have with those pools that people buy from the warehouse, those blow-up ones, and um, yeah, they just plop them in the backyard, but they're still a risk. Mm. Um, noise control is um, an activity near and dear to my heart at the moment because it is constantly under pressure, given our community behaviour post-COVID or during COVID, and even now as we go into... Um, Omicron phase, we have more and more of the traditional settings where people can go and um, get together, have um, gatherings, drink and um, party, have been closed or restricted in numbers and size, so more and more of these um, gatherings are happening at people's residences. Um, I don't know if you were aware, but last week I put a newsline story out there just to reflect and try and remind people of what um, their responsibilities were if they were to be hosting a party or a gathering as such. Um, so hopefully that will help educate and minimise the volume of complaints we're receiving. Um, and our level of service for noise control is down slightly for this time 
um, last year. It's at, um, well, for January, it's at 89.9%. So we have pulled it back from December slightly, um, and the contractor has got regular engagement with my team. Uh, we're meeting weekly and talking about issues they're um, incurring. They're recruiting more staff where they can possibly do so, and um, we're trying to make a positive impact in this space. But as you can imagine, Christchurch is a massive geographical space, and for our officers to get there within one hour of the call-out can sometimes be really challenging for them. Um, so at, year, at the moment for noise control, our year-end forecast is um, currently sitting at 85.6%. But hopefully the January outcome is showing a positive trajectory in the right way. Um, and I have my dashboard there for you all to have a look at and welcome any questions. Thank you very much, Tracy. And, uh Andrew. Um, thank you. So um, three short questions, all relating to freedom camping, if I can. Um, so in relation to paragraph 3.1, thanks very much indeed for the um, reminder of the changes that we made to the bylaw last year. Um, I'm assuming from your overall comments that implementation of those changes went well, any new signage was in place and people are generally complying with them? Yep, and whether or not the signage is clear and it's easy for our officers to enforce based on that signage. Okay. Um, I guess that brings me straight to my second question. Um, the infringement notices, I mean, 15 is a relatively low number compared to what we've seen other years, although it's early in the season and noting your comments about um, a greatly reduced number of campers compared to pre-COVID. Um, is there any pattern to what uh, what those notices have been issued for or where they've been issued? Are there any particular areas or particular activities that are causing the infringement? Well, the two areas are the Marine Parade and Ekaroa area. Um, and it is a pattern of staying longer in a prohibited area space. Or um, the other is not having a self-contained, not having verification or proof of a self-containment certification. Yeah. Okay, and then final question. You note um, reduced number of campers at Naval Point due to the reduced opportunity and the construction works there. Is there any sense of where those people are going instead? We haven't got any indication where they're going. We've just got indication they're not there. So. Okay, no, that's all good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Pauline. Well, thank you. But my question's around noise control and possibly nuisance control, um, uh, which noise controls generally I know at night time through early morning. But in my area where there's a lot of building intensification, I've had a lot of calls from people um, about, you know, excess noise on a construction site. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just wondering, do we have any tools that we can use to um, to control that? Because some of these sites, it's, it's very, very loud yelling, including bad language, and often a loud ra commercial radio was advertising. Mm -hmm. And when people have to put up with that for like six months, it can be quite tough. And then the nuisance is when they create and leave rubbish around that blows around the streets and parking across driveways. And I'm not in any way saying that every site is like that, yep. but um, the ones who are, it's very stressful on the neighbourhood. So do we have any tools to, that we can use to address that or not? The district plan allows us to address construction noise, and that is the hammer and the nail kind of construction noise, not persons on the construction right. site making noise. Yep. Um, we also do have a component of the district plan that allows us to address stereo noise coming from um, properties, so that is our typical noise um, complaint that we receive both day and night, and the rules apply to um, whether it is a portable stereo or whether it is a big um, stereo that's occupying a party. So we can address that type of thing. And we can also address the litter from the Litter Act perspective if it is um, to a point where it is seen to be a nuisance. All right, so that, that would be the best way for people to call in and or, or lodge a... Um Yep. A, a request for service and using those three things. Yes, absolutely. The parking thing doesn't fit within my, my responsibility, but yeah. if they're having challenges with parking or people parking over um, private right, right of ways, absolutely call in and we'll, the team will go and investigate it. I know that for certain. Great, thank you. That's helpful. Thank you, Pauline. Any further questions? No, well, um, oh, sorry, Erin. Just, just a quick one on sound, and I had kind of asked it at committee level before, but I think I heard recently it's, there might be something going through government around noise complaints. 
back in the old days, someone turned up with a metre and stood outside and they go, oh yeah, 55 decibels or six, whatever, pick your number, you're over, can't do it, just walk in, tap on the door and go, you're too loud, turn it down. Now it's subjective and people seem to complain about that a lot because they go, well, what's too loud? Yeah. Why do we not just have a metre? So whether it's a factory or whatever is allowed in an area, it's just one rule because that's how you do speeding. Cop yeah. can't pull you over and go, oh, you're going too quick. It's 38, buddy. Yeah, but I think that's too quick. Yeah. Well, why the difference? So there is two aspects to it. Under the RMA, we can use a metre as a gauge for noise levels, and we do do that um, in, in many circumstances. But when we are responding to party noise, it's under the district plan, and that is a subjective measure in the district plan. So we can only administer the tools we have, and um, we can't sort of cross over those tools. So, so how does someone having a party, just to put a foot in both camps, know that they're too loud or not too loud? Well, generally, when we turn up, <laughs> I mean, as in the news um, line report that I said to um, everybody in the community, when you're having a party, it's really important to let your neighbours know, speak to them, um, engage with them, get your people inside before 10 o'clock if you can, um, watch the base level because base is always the thing that um, intrudes private um, residences. Um, there's some key things that people can do invite to still invite the neighbours. Yeah. Um, yeah, but they can do to not make it obtrusive to na the neighbours in the area. But that still doesn't say how loud you can be. Yeah, we've also got the level of, um, when we have to do noise meter readings, we have to be observant of the ambient noise around us. So if we are on a, prop, on a street that is heavy traffic, we have to silence out any ambient noise. So that's to be fair to the people we are actually monitoring because if you were having a party and you were on John's Road, for instance, um, busy road, you could be clobbered for having um, the noise of the traffic generating the noise of your party as well. So to do meter readings, it's not a, a two minute job. You actually have to do a 15 minute block of meter reading before you can actually determine whether or not it's exceeding the required um, decibel levels. So when we respond to um, noise complaints, it is a subjective reading where the officer pulls up at the property, listens, gauges, and um, makes the assessment at that time. Right. Thank you, Aaron. Any further questions? I'm happy to move from the chair. Thank you, Pauline. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? Abstentions? Aye. So, Sam, is that a. Thank you. Oh, yep, cool. Thank, yep. So, thank you very much, Tracy. Thank you. And now we. Item 12, John. Welcome, John. Thank you. And I will let you introduce. Okay, so this is the, um, the first report from the new planning consents um, unit, which combines planning functions, uh, heritage, urban design, and resource consents. Um, it was sort of an awkward time of year, so this is a very brief report, and the intention is to sort of expand it out over time. Um, so the first topic I touch on is the Resource Management Act to reform, and um, there's not too much to report on that. Um, you'll probably be, be aware of some of it, but there were some questions posed to the councils and um, we've been working on a response on that. Um, probably the key thing to note is that the dialogue between um, the council and MFE is improving, and that's a really positive sign. And um, various selected members might have been involved in, in some of that work, but um, definitely we're now meeting weekly with MFE staff, so we're getting some really good input into the, um, the design of the future system, so that's, that's been a really positive step. Um, moving over into the resource consents area, and um, like building, we've got pressures in terms of the workloads. Um, we're seeing a decrease in compliance of statutory time frame, and um, you'll note in this report it's um, decreased from 98% to 87%, so we're not too bad, but it's um, it's decreasing all the time, and obviously we would like to be a lot higher, um, around that 99% um, target. Now we're taking some fairly significant steps in that space. Um, we're recruiting, um, it's difficult to get people. Um, 
we're using consultants but uh, over capacity as well and reluctant to take our work so they're only taking a few applications at a time and there's a lot of other things um, we're doing too but um, probably quite focused on process efficiency now and I'll give you some examples of what we're, we're sort of looking at um, we're issuing a few global consents so we just did one um, this morning actually so a swimming pool company they require often earthworks consent so we've done one consent which will you know mean we'll get 20 or 30 less consents for swimming pools so we're, we're trying to utilize the tools we've got currently to try and reduce the, the workloads um, one of the things we have, we're in the process of doing is creating a focus subdivision team too so we've got more focus on that subdivision area and Phil mentioned before about um, stamp plans being an issue and I presume that's to do with Greenfield subdivision and some of the assets that need stamp plans to um, to get through that, that part. Um, so we are getting people into the bottom end of that subdivisions team to um, chase up those sort of asset areas of council, keep um, really good tabs on um, how consents are processing in particular that two to four stage. So um, hopefully we'll see some improvements in that area and improvements across the board. Um, surprisingly, we're not getting too much feedback at this stage about delays. Um, our customer satisfaction's at 85%, which is noted in 4.6, um, but that's, that's not um, minimizing the impacts of the, you know, the delays that are currently being experienced in the um, construction industry. But we're, we're hopeful we'll, we'll start to see some um, better progress in that area. Thank you very much, John. And just to remind people, and John alluded to it, there's been some changes in this unit. So while they've been juggling those, um, they've also been keeping up with the demands from the public and our clients. So please keep that in, um, uh, in front of mind when asking questions. And although it's a brief report, John, it's a very good one. So thank you very much. So I'll take questions. OK. And uh, Michael, oh, uh, Phil, have you got a seat? Sorry. Yep. Um, John, this is a great report, nice and short, lovely, lovely short report. Um, with with you, what you've got here is uh, at 1,100 uh, applications up until December. What What's your gut feeling now you've got January behind you? Is it tapering off? Because what I do, as <laughs> I've seen yep. happen, people think the world ends at Christmas time and they rush like crazy and get stuff in. Yep. Has it backed off a wee bit? Would you feel it's sort of we're at the crest of the wave and things are coming right? Um, it's, it's hard to tell. So the, um, January is normally quite a quiet period for lodgement of consents. Um, we've seen higher numbers than usual, what we would see comparatively with um, previous years. Um, I think it's too early to sort of try and make any predictions from what we're seeing in January. Um, and we'll get more of an idea in February and March, but um, I don't know if it's going to tail off, but we we sort of wonder where all these applications are coming from. Because <laughs> um, a lot of the work is multi-unit um, residential, and um, it's been going on for a while, so there's a lot to be built yet, and there's a lot under construction at the moment, so you wonder how strong that market is. Mm. Thank, thank you. I, I was just going to um, respond to, to Councillor Donovan's question before about the um, the new RMA um, liberalisation of um, intensification. Um, we may see some more um, some more development come in. We may also see um, a shift in where development occurs. So. Um, you know, uh, there's lots of intensification zones now across the city which are being um, uh, picked up for development. You may see some shifts into some other areas like the what we call the residential suburban zone. So there might be some attractive opportunities there, but we, we may not necessarily see much more. We just may see it shifting to different areas. Time will tell. Thank you very much. Um, Jimmy, you had a question? Yeah, one question. Okay, yep. thank you, thank you. And thank you. The John, your particular mentioned the, uh, the the number of non notified uh, application, you know, increased a lot. So due to the workload, but I just want to know, based on this uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, this chart, I'm not sure <laughs> this uh, historian chart. This one. Yes. The, how many the, the kind of applications working days? But it looks like it's more. No more kind of long notified application, the, the possession days increase. 
So I just want to know, except the number increase, whether the criteria have any the the the, the uh, change, you know, difference uh, uh, from the RMA or not. And uh, otherwise, why you know the non notify should be more simple can be process. Why still take the more time you know, to process those the, the number of the non notified application? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, well, the RMA has changed over time to um, uh, to get more non-notified applications. Um, so that's changed. The district plan also um, introduced uh, more non-notified non applications. And what we've seen is applications that may have been notified in the past are non-notified now. That doesn't mean they're not complex. So, for example, a quarry could be um, non-notified. Doesn't mean it's not complex. It just doesn't um, meet that threshold for for notification, and that may be for a number of reasons. But um, so, while you're seeing more non-notified applications, the complexity of those non-notification decisions are higher, and actually, it's less. It's more risk for the council for non-notified applications to notify, because the real risk is around judicial review and that you didn't notify. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any further questions? Thank you. Right. No, it's, it's been moved and seconded. So I'll put it, all those in favour? Any against? Thank you. Any abstentions? Thank you very much. Um, you. Just before I ask Councillor Templeton to close with the karakia, I'd just like to thank Jane and her um, teams led by John, Robert and Tracy for all their work and to the committee and on behalf of the committee members. Thank you very much for that and to your staff. I'd also like to um, say a special thanks to Liz and uh, the administration team for supporting the committee over the years. So um, thank you very much to those guys as well. And now I will ask um, Sarah Templeton to close the meeting with the karakia, please. Tukuna te wairoa ki arere ki te taumata. Ko te matatika, te matapono he arahi i na mahi. Ka arohatahi te tira kia ake panuku, kia eke tangaroa. Pumie, huie, tai kia. Kira. I declare the meeting closed. Thank you. Thank you.